Are you ready for another big day of volume with known cross sections? Yesterday we tackled squares and rectangles and semicircles. We set up some great slice analysis and then, uh, you know, had some really good integrals. And uh, today we're going to move on. We're going to tackle all of our triangles and that includes three specific ones. Number one, we're going to look at some equilateral triangles like we have here on the left edge of your screen. And uh, boy, I tell you, this is one of those days where I wish I had the same artistic ability as whoever drew this beautiful picture over here. And then we're also going to look at isosceles right triangles. And we're going to look at two specific cases. One where, the, like as this picture shows, it's lying on its leg. And so what we've got here is we've got a leg here, and we've got a leg here, and then um, this is the hypotenuse. Um, so our second example, after we do ones where they're laying on the leg, we're going to flip it around and we're going to lay it on its hypotenuse. And it's actually going to change uh, not just the area of the slice, but also the volume of the overall uh, object. All right, this is going to be a fun little segment. We're going to go back in our little time machine and go back to geometry, and we're going to review some basic properties of an equilateral triangle. Now... The slice that we end up drawing on, um, on our diagram later on today is this is the slice is going to represent the base of the triangle. So we're going to have a slice on our picture and that's going to equal the base of our triangle. Now, so that part's easy. You're like, all right, I got that done. The hard part is going to be finding the height of our triangle. So our goal here is we want to express the height in terms of its base, okay? So let's write that down as our goal. We want to express the height of an equilateral triangle in terms of its base. Okay, so here we go. Well, what do we know about an equilateral triangle? Let's say, um, let's say for right now we said, all right, the length of the base is x units long. Well, the good news is, is we know the height is going to not only be perpendicular to the base, but it's also going to bisect it for an equilateral triangle. So we've created a right angle here, and the distance from here to here is now one half of x. And so what I want to do now is I want to focus in on the right triangle that we've created here to here. All right, so we're looking at just this right triangle. And I know that all the angles were originally 60 degrees at the beginning of the problem because it's equilateral. So that bears 60. This one up here is now bisected, so it's only 30. But what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to set up a little trig function that's going to help me find the height in terms of its base. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the tangent of 60 degrees equals, well, with regards to the 60, so I'll pretend I'm standing right there, I need to do the opposite divided by the adjacent. So I'm going to say the height divided by 1 half of x. We know that the tangent of 60 is simply radical 3. So as I try to solve for height, I'm going to cross multiply, and I'm going to end up with radical 3 divided by 2 times x equals the height. And so there it is, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, x represents your base. So the height is always going to be radical 3 over 2 times the base, and that's a little proportion that will be true for all equilateral triangles. We're going to take advantage of that today. Well, not to be outdone by the equilateral triangle, we're now going to take a look at the right isosceles triangle and review some of his basic properties. And like we said, there's two scenarios we're going to investigate today. One scenario is where it's laying on its side, or one of its legs like we have here in this picture. So this right here will be the base. And the beautiful news about isosceles is that in this case, whatever the base equals, the height is going to equal exactly the same thing. So we'll say ditto the base. Um, so they're obviously being congruent because they're isosceles. Now, where things are going to get crazy, all right, is when we rotate this for our second scenario, what we're going to do is we're going to rotate this object and flip it around so that it's laying on its hypotenuse, okay? So I'm going to start over, I'm going to grab a new slide, and we're going to take a look at how things change when it lays on its hypotenuse. Okay, so like we said, we're going to kind of rotate this bugger around, and we're going to say it's now laying on its hypotenuse. So when we draw the slice within the region R that serves as our flat base, our slice is representing the length of the hypotenuse. And that will be our base because that's what it's laying on. But what we don't know all of a sudden is the height of this particular triangle. Now, good news is this. Now, we know that these angles right here are for 45 each. Okay, 45 here, 45 here. Of course, we had 90 at the top. Again, the height not only is perpendicular to the base, but it also bisects it. 
So let's say the distance from here to here is one half of the base, and I'm trying to find the height. Again, I'm going to set up a little trig proportion here. So I'm going to say that the tangent of 45 degrees is equal to the height divided by one half of its base. Tangent of 45 is a beautiful one. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cross multiply and I got that the height is always equal to one half of its base. That's a pretty simple proportion or relationship right there to memorize. It's not quite as ugly as the equilateral. And so again, that's one more thing. You know, I, I, I hate to use the word memorize. You might want to commit it to memory. Or if you're ever stuck, I, I don't think it's too much to ask. You, you could re, you know, recreate this little drawing, recreate this little trig setup, and solve for that relationship between the height and the base. And the same goes for the equilateral. I think we can recreate that as we go. So here we are. Let's dive into our first live example. We're considering region R being a flat surface bounded between um, Y equals Let's see, let me grab, okay, y equals x squared and, and y equals 4x minus x squared. And within that region, we're drawing slices whose cross sections are equilateral triangles. So we're going to go ahead and uh, let's say, you know, we're going to say there's my slice right there. And the length of that slice serves as the base of the triangle. So as I go through my slice analysis, and I can't over... Um, emphasize how important our slice analysis is and of course when we go to do our projects this will be a major component of the project that we do. Um, the base is going to be simple upper minus lower 4x minus x squared minus the lower function x squared. Um, the height now remember this is one of those relationships we just built. The height is going to be radical 3 divided by 2 times its base. So the height here is going to be radical 3 over 2 times 4x minus 2x squared. The area of a triangle is one half times base times height. So by the time I multiply those all together, I'm going to end up with radical 3 over 4 because I had one half times that coefficient and then times the quantity 4x minus 2x squared all squared. Now I tell you, at that point, you've done 99% of the work. All you got to do for volume is say, you know what? We're going to slap an integral. We're going to integrate from x equals 0 up until x equals 2, just because there's, uh, right there's your x-coordinate, 2. And radical 3 over 4 I certainly could have pulled that out. Just didn't leave myself enough room was all. 4x minus 2x squared quantity squared. What are you throwing at the end? Hopefully you're throwing a dx on there. Well, if I had to rank all the ones that we're doing, I tell you, I'd rank uh, isosceles, uh, or right isosceles lying on its leg is one of the very easiest ones. Um, so let's go ahead, we'll draw our slice, and the length of that slice represents the base of my triangle. So my slice analysis starts off with a base of 4x, and I'm going to cut right to the chase, minus 2x squared. We've done it enough times. The height, because the fact that it's an isosceles triangle, the height and the base are congruent. So we got 4x minus 2x squared, and the area is going to be 1 half base times height. 1 half the quantity 4x minus 2x squared squared. So we are in cruise control. We are really humming through these babies. 1 half integral from x equals 0 to x equals 2 of the quantity 4x minus 2x squared. And what do you want to throw at the end of this, rascal? You got it. Let's make sure our dx is on there. We certainly don't want to lose a simple, measly little point on a free response question because we don't have our dx on there. Well, uh, now let's try the very last one, the sixth out of six popular cross-sections that we're going to introduce you to. Um, we're going to talk about a right isosceles triangle that's lying on its hypotenuse. So when I go ahead and I draw that slice in here, the length of that slice is corresponding to the hypotenuse, and then the rest of the triangle is coming out of the page at you, almost like a projected hologram, so to speak. Um, and uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say, well, that bear right there, the base is uh, 4x minus 2x squared. Again, and it goes without saying, uh, the two regions that are forming region R are the same two we've been using on the last couple of examples. The height is, this is the relationship we, we built on an earlier slide. We said the height's always going to be one half of the base. So the height's one half of 4x minus 2x squared. And you can see what's coming here, the area of one slice. It's going to be one half base times height. So I ended up with a coefficient of one fourth. By the time I multiplied one half by one half, 4x minus 2x squared squared. And then finishing touch volume is 1 fourth integral from 0 to 2. 4x minus 2x squared 
squared throw with the x on there. All right, as we get ready to start the next example, we do make a mental note. Uh, we are not allowed to use our calculator in this particular example. And a lot of you uh, let out a huge groan when you saw this bolded part right here perpendicular to the y-axis. That means we've got to draw our slices, well, of, yes, perpendicular to the y-axis. And since it's horizontal, everything needs to be in terms of y, in terms of y, in terms of y. So let's go ahead and give this bear a look. Uh, 3 radical x we talked about yesterday. Looks like this, y equals 6, and they intersect at x equals 4. And we're going to draw our slices perpendicular to the x-axis, or y-axis, just like that. Now, we are shooting for an equilateral triangle, so the length of that slice is the base of my triangle. And that's the same no matter what we're talking about, whether we're talking about a square or a rectangle. Uh, if it was a semicircle, the length would be my diameter, and so forth and so forth. So I'm going to say right minus left. And I believe yesterday we solved for x and we said x is really equal to y squared divided by 9. So that would be my length, y squared divided by 9. The height is going to be radical 3 over 2 times the base. So we could really say radical 3 over 18 y squared if we cleaned it up a touch. Now the area is going to be 1 half base times height. So my coefficient ultimately is radical 3 over 36, believe it or not. And then base times height, it, whoa, 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 whoops, I forgot about the other 9. Maybe I should slow down here a little bit. Let me slow down. Area is going to be 1 half my base, which is y squared over 9, times my height, which is radical 3 over 18 y squared. Yeah, okay. So what are we getting? This is a monster coefficient. So just to kind of ease things up, I'm going to say radical 3 all over 18 squared. Uh, 2 times 9 is 18, 18 times 18, 18 squared, y to the fourth. So the integral is going to look like this. Let's see, volume. We've got a coefficient of radical 3 over 18 squared. Big number, right? Uh, let's go integral from 0 to 6 because everything's in terms of y. y to the fourth, finish with a dy. Boom, there it is. Again, we're going to piggyback off of a region R that we were introduced to yesterday. We are using the calculator. It's very calculator active. And we have the E function and the natural log function. And uh, I believe the E function behaved roughly like this. And the natural log function behaved like that. And we found the intersection. That was A comma B. A was the X, B was the Y. And this up here was C comma D. And we did talk about, now we are perpendicular to the y-axis again, so I need to take these functions and solve them for x. And I believe, let's, I'll draw some arrows. Just to recap what we found out yesterday, on the first function we said x is equal to 2 times the natural log of y. And on the second function we came up with something that was a little wilder looking, but we got x equals e raised to the y minus 6 all divided by 2 power plus a 1. Okay, and let's see. So if I'm going to be perpendicular to the y-axis, I need my horizontal slice here. And the length of that slice is going to be the base of my triangle, which in this case is the hypotenuse. I'm picturing an equilateral triangle, or I'm sorry, not an equilateral, but a right isosceles. And we know that the height is going to be one half of the base. So anyway, the base is right edge minus left edge. So I'm going e to the y minus 6 divided by 2 plus 1 power minus 2 ln of y. I'll tell you what, hopefully you caught that at home. I think I totally screwed that up. I think uh, 2 ln of y is the right edge. So let me start all over there. Let's say the base is 2 natural log of y minus e to the y minus 6 divided by 2 plus 1. Okay, now I feel better. Now we feel better. Here we go. Here we go. Um, now the height is going to be exactly one half of that guy's length. So, of course, we could distribute the one half through or we could leave it pulled out. And just to simplify matters, I'm going to leave it pulled out like this. Okay, starting to use square brackets just to stay organized. And let's see, the area of one individual slice, one-half base times height. So I'm going to go one-fourth, and then this gigantic quantity is going to be squared. Okay, so a rather messy problem, but we're getting 
getting through it. Volume is going to be one fourth the integral from. Now we need bounds in terms of y, so I'm going to go b for the lower bound. I'm going to go d for the upper, and then it's just going to be the area expression all squared. Okay. So the hardest part about this one just might be the organization in your handwriting so that it all stays neat, nice and neat and readable. All right, so there it is. Now, the last couple of slides I've got saved for you are some rather thought-provoking ones. They're going to be outside the box a little bit, but they're based off of the same concept of using slice analysis. So here we go. So we're sticking with the same region with these funky um, functions, E and LN. Now, this time region... Um, we're talking about cross sections perpendicular to the x axis. Now, at each x, there's a section that has an area of cosine of pi x plus 2. So here's the deal we've got this slice, and I don't know, it's not necessarily a popular geometric shape like a square or a rectangle or a semicircle or a triangle, but what I do know is that its area is equal to the cosine of pi x over 2 plus 2 power. Okay, now, so a lot of times that was our end goal. We always wanted to get area, but we couldn't get it until we first, you know, we had to find the base, we had to find the height, and then we were able to get the area. Well, we skipped forward, we fast-forwarded over those two steps, and we got right to area. So, the, and that's great news, guys. I know it, it may feel a little more confusing, but that's great news, because once you got area, all you got to do is throw an integral on that, and you've got volume. So we're going to say the volume of this crazy creature is going to be the integral from A to to C because we're going from the X coordinate to the X coordinate and just we're taking the area function here and we're going to slap a little integral on it, we've got a little DX at the end, boom, there it is. Maybe some square brackets just to clarify and that, there it is. Okay, our very last one is certainly the most thought-provoking one. It's the hardest one to visualize by far. And like many of these problems, uh, you know, until we get a clear image in our mind of what's happening, it's a very, very pro difficult problem to set up. But we're gonna we're gonna work together. We're gonna do the best we can. Again, we're working with the the same challenging upper and lower functions here. Maybe and maybe I should have done this right from the get go. I'm gonna call the the first function there f, and let's call the second one g, just to kind of shorten things up a little bit. So the, let's see, we got F right here, and then we've got, uh, let's see, we got G right there. Okay, so here's what's happening. They're saying, I want you to imagine that region R right here is the surface of a pond, okay? And at all points at a distance of X from the Y axis, the depth of the water is given by H of X. So what's happening is, like, right here when X equals 2, the depth is 5, and then when x equals 3, the depth is 4, and then when x equals 4, the depth is 3, and it gets progressively more shallow as we go across. So that's kind of an interesting thought. They want us to find the volume of the water in the pond. Well, I'll tell you what, believe it or not, I'm going to use a slice analysis approach, just like what I've been doing here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, well, here's just a random slice that I'm going to take right out of the middle of the pond, and I'm going to in analyze that really skinny little slice. And I'm going to say that little slice has a width, of g of x minus f of x. Okay, in other words, upper minus lower, just like we've been doing. And we'll say that's my width or my base. And the height or the depth is going to be given by this function here, h. Okay, so if I want the area of that one individual slice, I'm going to say you know base times height or width times height, whatever, however you want to say it, and I'm going to end up with h times g minus f. All right. Now, just like all of these, once you got area, you're pretty much locked in. You're golden. The volume of the entire pond is going to be the integral from A to C of H of X times G of X minus F of X. So that's all there is to it. That's actually all we have to do to set this one up and find the volume of the pond. But I think it all goes back to the simple approaches saying instead of being overwhelmed by the entire pond, let's just take a look at one really thin slice. Let's analyze that one little slice. Let's find out how wide it is, how deep it is, or how tall it is. Find the area of that one slice, and then we're golden from there. So, um, you know, continue to, to you know, try to visualize these. Work hard on your sketches. Work hard on your setups, and the end result will take care of itself. So good luck, and we'll see you tomorrow.